In 2005, the police in Phoenix, the capital of the state of Arizona in the USA, were experiencing one of the most stressful situations. Several serial killers were simultaneously operating in their district, robbing, raping, and murdering women, men, and even pets. Mark Gaudo was a native of Phoenix and was born on September 6, 1964 to a lower-class family. He had 14 siblings and Mark was the youngest of them all. Some sources say that the Gaudo family had problems with illegal substances. Although not all of them went down a bad path, many became good and hardworking people. Mark's mother died when he was 12 years old and he moved in with his older sister. He attended high school where he played American soccer, though not as successfully as his older brother Michael. In high school, due to financial difficulties, Mark Gaudo was forced to start working and lost interest in his studies due to underachievement. He eventually dropped out of school in 1982, shortly before completing the 12th grade. That same year, a girl contacted the police, claiming that during 1981, Mark and his brother Michael had repeatedly raped her on the grounds of her home. However, during the investigation, the police found that the girl led an antisocial lifestyle and voluntarily engaged in intimate relations with the brothers, due to which her testimony was questioned. Mark Gaudo was not charged with anything, and the girl soon left Phoenix. But that was just the beginning. At the age of 23, Mark Gaudo was arrested for trespassing and a year later for Dewey. At age 25, he was charged with sexual assault and attempted second-degree murder. The victim's identity was never released, but the press referred to her as Darling. In the early morning hours of August 6, 1989, police responded to a call of people reporting that a man was beating a semi-conscious woman with the butt of a shotgun in a parking lot. Officers arrived on the call and found Darling naked from the waist down and with her head bleeding. Witnesses said they saw a man walking away and that he had an additional revolver on him. The woman was hospitalized with a fractured skull, deep lacerations, and hematoma all over her body. When she was able to testify three days later, she stated that the assailant was Mark Gaudo and gave her address. Darling said that they knew each other and that while in her apartment, Mark repeatedly beat her, threw her in the bathtub, and tried to drown her. She managed to escape, however, and her attacker chased her to the parking lot. Police arrested Gaudo, who said he had consensual sexual intercourse with Darling. When two armed men, one with an assault rifle, beat her and left, he claimed he was helping the woman get to her grandmother's house. When the men returned and beat her again, after which they fled, no one believed Mark. Gaudo faced decades in prison, but a series of mistakes and judicial leniency allowed a plea bargain to be reached. As part of the deal, Gaudo pleaded guilty to three counts of aggravated assault in exchange for dropping the dangerous behavior charges. That made him eligible for parole after a year. When he was scheduled to be sentenced, Gaudo, for reasons that are unclear, was at large and robbed a supermarket. Using a silver handgun, which has been described in a number of other cases, he forced employees to escort him to his car. Many people saw the scene and alerted authorities, reporting the model of the car and its license plate number. Officers soon apprehended Mark at his apartment along with the stolen money. One would think that the armed robbery and kidnapping charges would be in addition to the charges he was already facing for assaulting Darling, and therefore he would receive a more substantial sentence. But in fact, in the case of the rape of the woman, the judge sentenced Mark to 15 years in prison with the possibility of parole after 10 years. In the second case, also thanks to a plea bargain, he was sentenced to only four years. After 13 years in prison, on March 8, 2004, Mark Gaudo appeared for a hearing before the State Parole Board. There, it was determined that he had behaved well in prison and had undergone several self-help programs. In addition, the inmate had married a woman named Vendicar, with whom he had lived prior to his incarceration. At the hearing, Wendy and a prison activist spoke in favor of Gaudo, saying that alcohol and illegal substances were the cause of his bad behavior. In the end, the commission, which had the decision in its hands, voted 4-1 to one in favor of Mark Gaudo's early release. Mark and Wendy got back together to start a new life. Away from crime, the man reportedly took a job as a laborer for a large construction company. There, he was considered a diligent worker and enjoyed great popularity among his co-workers. Life was going well for the couple and the community at large in the neighborhood, but a series of crimes began to threaten the peace of Phoenix residents. On August 6, 2005, three teenage girls were attacked by an armed man who forced them behind a church off a road called Line Road Base, where he abused two of them. It was the beginning of a long list of crimes that would keep the city's public on high alert and intelligence agencies on a tense search in the months to come. A week later, on Aug. 14, another sexual assault was reported, in which the victim's belongings were stolen. 
Three weeks later, in early September, the murder of a young woman named Georgia Thompson, who was only 19 years old, was reported. Her body was found with her shirt unbuttoned, pants unbuttoned and a gunshot wound to the head, and her wallet was never found. Another sexual assault occurred on September 15, and just five days later, two young sisters walking home from the park. One of the girls was pregnant, but that didn't stop the man from attacking them and forcing them at gunpoint to a secluded area where he raped the younger girl, pointing the gun at her pregnant sister's stomach. On September 28, 2005, two separate crimes were reported, robbery and sexual assault with robbery. In the days, weeks, and months that followed, the crimes continued to combine into a mix of sexual assault with robbery. The incidents were reported in a radius close to Baseline Road, which is why the unknown offender became known as the Baseline Rapist. On Nov, 3 and Nov, 7, multiple crimes were committed. On Nov, 3, a robbery was reported at 8 p.m. and a sexual assault was reported near that location nine minutes later. That same day, a man, described as swarthy with dreadlocks and wearing a fisherman's hat, entered a store and stole $720 at gunpoint. Less than 10 minutes later, it was reported that a man wearing a Halloween costume and plastic goggles sexually assaulted a young woman who was depositing items in a donation garbage can. After the assault, the offender demanded that the victim drive him around the corner because he had just committed a robbery. Four days later, a mystery man robbed 11 people between restaurants that were on the same street. After the last robbery, the perpetrator fired a shot in the air, the bullet casing was recovered. On deck, 12, an already dire situation only got worse. That night, Phoenix homicide detectives were called to the scene of the discovery of a woman's body. Investigators arrived on the scene and found the woman's body lying face up in a pool of blood. The woman had been shot twice in the head at close range. She had no wallet or documents, only a shopping bag with a Christmas pattern. Police were contacted by a man who said he may have seen the killer. His name was Peter Chova, and he worked at the very warehouse where he said the fast food outlet behind which the body was found was located. According to Peter, he heard a knock on the back door and thought there were children playing soccer in the area. A Chowa went outside to ward them off and saw a man wearing a hooded sweatshirt leaning over the motionless body. The hooded man also saw a chav, and he stood up and pointed his silver-colored handgun at the worker and fired, but the gun did not work. Peter immediately ran away and locked himself in the warehouse. Inside at the scene, investigators found two fired .38 caliber bullet casings and a whole bullet that did not hit Peter Chav. The next day, authorities determined from fingerprints that the victim was 39-year-old Tina Washington, who worked at the daycare center from which she was leaving when she was attacked. Authorities notified Tina's family and asked one of her adult sons if his mother wore jewelry. The grief-stricken young man replied that she wore a very unusual ring that had the names of her three children written next to each of the stones. An investigator recalled that the police department had circulated a notice about a man sexually assaulting and robbing women in the Baseline Road area and wondered if there was a connection between that and the other cases. In early 2006, the Phoenix Police Department created a special task force of experienced detectives to investigate these cases and assigned approximately 100 street cops to support the investigations on an ongoing basis. The officers released a sketch of a man with dreadlocks and wearing a fisherman's hat, based on the victim's statements. The sketch was distributed to all media outlets. Police held community meetings to disseminate the image, which was later even placed on advertising accounts offering a $100,000 reward for information leading to the man's arrest. But the number of crimes continued to rise. On February 20, 2006, shortly after 7.30 a.m., the lifeless bodies of 38-year-old Romilia Vargas and 34-year-old Mina Palma Roman were found in the food truck where they worked. Both were shot and killed. The following month, on March 15, two employees of Yoshi's restaurant were found dead. The body of Liliana Sanchez Cabrera, 20, was found in the parking lot of the fast food restaurant, and the body of her co-worker Chow Chow was found two kilometers away from that location. Both had been shot in the head. Two weeks later, on March 29, a local businessman called the police after finding traces of blood in the parking lot. The authorities arrived at the scene, but searched the area but found nothing. A week later, the same complainant called the police again because he found the body of a woman in a state of deep decomposition and with a gunshot wound to the head. The victim was identified as Nicole Gibson. On April 10th, an eight-year-old boy was returning home from school when he went inside and heard water running in the bathroom. Upon entering, he discovered the dead body of his mother, Sophia Nunes. The cause of death was a gunshot to the head. 
On May 1st, in the parking lot of the same restaurants where 11 people were robbed in November, a man wearing a latex Halloween mask abducted a woman from the interior of a car and sexually assaulted her. The investigator's task was not easy, there were no witnesses to what happened, and to make matters worse, there was another series of random victims, including men, women and even pets, who were shot from a moving vehicle. There were other serial killers operating in parallel. In late June, 30-year-old Carmen Miranda was abducted from a car wash while she was on the phone with her boyfriend, who heard her screaming as she was attacked. Her attacker overpowered her, got behind the wheel of the car and drove about 100 meters away, parking behind a hair salon where the woman was later found with a gunshot wound to the forehead. This attack was captured by a CCTV camera, but the image was too grainy to recognize the attacker. At this time, the perpetrator was renamed the Baseline Killer. At this point, you are probably wondering, as I am, how with so many sexual assaults there was no mention of DNA samples to identify the perpetrator, because in a subsequent Superior Court case, it was argued that the police department failed to timely test available DNA samples. That may have been partly true, because as the summer progressed, detectives handling the case began pushing for more urgency in processing the DNA as evidence. It has been learned that investigators found DNA on the breast of a girl who was assaulted in the presence of her pregnant sister. Phoenix laboratory experts immediately recovered a sample from the left breast, which was contaminated, but it was still preserved. However, after analyzing it, they concluded that it was not enough to identify the suspect. This and other samples were sent to the Arizona State Crime Lab, which had more resources than the Phoenix Lab, and a list of 75 potential suspects was sent there. Meanwhile, a state prison investigator contacted the task force on the case and reported that a certain woman claims to have seen a sketch of the baseline killer and knows who he is. She recognized him as Mark Gaudo. The female caller turned out to be Darling, whose rape had first put him behind bars. A man was ordered to be located and placed under surveillance. On July 21, 2006, a detective and probation officer visited Mark and he agreed to provide the requested fingerprint and DNA samples. Ballistics experts were able to analyze the bullets and casings found at the crime scene and from the victims and determined that they were all fired from the same weapon, a .38 caliber handgun. Thus, it was confirmed that all these cases were linked and that the same person was responsible for them. Finally, experts from the Arizona State Crime Lab analyzed the sample taken from the left breast and, using a new procedure, were able to isolate and identify male DNA. On September 2, 2006, he reported to Phoenix Police that the genetic sample belonged to Mark Gatto. The same profile would later be matched to other rape victims. On September 6, his 42nd birthday, Gatto was arrested without resistance in front of his home. He was initially arrested for raping one of his sisters, and over time the charges were expanded to include several other incidents of sexual assault. Most of the assaults took place in a perimeter of about 4 kilometers around Mark's house. Investigators conducted several examinations and searches of Gaudo's home. Among the first items seized was a pair of white sneakers, which caught the attention of police because many victims cited the assailant's use of white or black shoes. Although the shoes had been washed, forensics found DNA from the two murdered victims in them. One belonged to the only male murdered, Mark Chow Chow, and the other belonged to Nicole Gibbons, who was killed in late March 2005. The lead detective on the case was unhappy that only white sneakers were seized, suspecting that there might be more evidence on the other shoes. Since almost all of Gaudo's victims had been shot at close range, a warrant was issued to search Mark's home again based on the evidence from the first pair of shoes. The task of collecting and analyzing the remaining shoes became a Herculean task, as Gaudo had dozens of pairs of shoes. But the work was worth it. Inside a brown leather shoe and a sealed plastic sandwich bag, several articles of clothing were found, including Tina Washington's ring and bracelet. After Mark Gaudo's arrest, his wife Vendicar became his chief defense attorney, claiming that the Phoenix police findings were lies and that officials planted the evidence found in their home to frame her husband and become famous for solving one of Arizona's most shocking criminal cases. However, Phoenix police have published hundreds of pages detailing all the steps taken in the investigation of the baseline killer. It has become known that investigators had at least 10 suspects, but in the course of further investigation they have already ruled out several people, and Marco Gatto's name appears in these documents, albeit in rare mentions. Phoenix police charged Mark Gatto with 74 counts, including 9 counts of first-degree murder, sexual assault, attempted sexual assault, kidnapping, armed robbery and other crimes. 
Among them was the April 10, 2006 murder of Sofia Nunes, who appeared to know her attacker because he had installed a video surveillance system in her home. In March 2017, the prosecution announced it would seek the death penalty for Gaudo. Following two trials, one in 2007 and the other in 2011, Mark Gaudo was found guilty of committing 76 crimes against 33 victims. For his acts, he was sentenced to 1,634 years in prison and the death penalty for each of the nine murders. Mark Gaudo is currently on death row in the state of Arizona. Dale Hausner and Samuel Dietemann were other serial killers who acted in parallel with Mark Gaudo. They committed most of their crimes by shooting from a moving vehicle, probably motivated by sporting interest. However, they were also arsonists and hired killers. Between May 2005 and August 2006, Hausner and Dietemann killed eight people in at least 29 shootings. They were allegedly under the influence of illegal substances, and as a result, many people and pets were hurt and several fires were set. Authorities eventually apprehended them and the case went to trial. Dale Hosner was sentenced to six death sentences without parole, and Samuel Dietemann was sentenced to life in prison without parole. What do you think of this story? Write your opinion in the comments to this video and put a like if you liked it.